we are live. Welcome to 2018's Incredibles 2 Review and Thoughts film. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we are talking about this movie and its depiction of Jack-Jack's special needs, and I suppose I won't give away exactly which character, but another character I would argue has social anxiety. So... This is going to be a mainly positive video. I, I like this movie a lot. It's not quite as good as the first one, but it is really, really good. And let's see. The video will be fairly light. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Now, as usual, my back... Uh, my back still hurts. I'm too stubborn to not do a video at all, so I'm probably going to be talking faster. So, this movie is rated PG. So is this video. The movie is not supposed to be for little children. Brad Bird has said as much, and he wrote and directed so he would know. A number of people didn't look up, and so complained. And, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and quote IMDb Trivia. In July 2018, the writer and director of Incredibles 2, Brad Bird, doubled down on his views that just because a movie is animated does not mean it is just for kids, when he called out concerned parents over Twitter for referring to Incredibles 2 as a kid's movie, saying, with all due respect, it is not a kid's movie. It is animated and rated PG. Later in November 2018, Bird called out iTunes for classifying both Incredibles movies as kid's movies, saying, our classification should be no different than adventure films from Marvel or Lucasfilm, just because we're animated. What would you call sexism or racism for an art form? Mediumism? And I do think some of the things are pushing it for PG, but on, ultimately, yeah, I, I agree with rating it PG for action sequences and some brief, mild language. Now, the... let's see... The plot... This is set right after the first one, with billionaires Evelyn and Winston Dever want to rehabilitate the image of supers, but the evil screen slaver looms large. And, yes, and quoting IMDb, The Incredibles family take on a new mission which involves a change in family roles. Bob Parr, Mr. Incredible, must manage the house, while his wife, Helen, a last girl, goes out to save the world. Since the original was somewhat old-fashioned in gender roles, though it did express empathy for each family member. And... That brings us... Right, as I said in my video for the first... I completely disagree with the reading of, you know, of thinking that these films are objectivist, aka the ridiculous philosophy put forth by Ayn Rand, who, beyond being a terrible writer, was just an awful person, trying to ensure that the government helped the needy as little as absolutely possible, whilst herself hypocritically living off welfare. I very rarely say that someone is lazy, in my opinion, the word lazy is usually used to excuse a lack of empathy for people who suffer from depression, anxiety, feel a lack of purpose, but she was a legitimately a lazy person. She refused to actually do work, and a lot of the things that she preached have ended up being made into law, because her work appeals to sociopaths, and there are a lot of sociopaths in government, because they like the power. Now, let's see, the... Yes, I, I think the, you know, the, the first movie's you know, the, the, when the regular people do frivolous lawsuits against supers, it means that supers have to retire. It might be criticism of holding police accountable. And, let's see. Yeah, so I'm just briefly gonna, you know, I would argue what should happen with police reform. I'm going, I largely agree with what Thought Slime says on the matter in his video, All Cops Are Bad. Uh, 
The problem isn't with individual cops, it's policing as an institution. Abolish the police and replace them with something more egalitarian. Currently, the police are very resistant to having their behavior scrutinized. Their actions make it clear they want to get away with extrajudicial violence. The police protect the rich, not the poor. The system isn't broken, it is made to keep the powerful in control. The police should be abolished and replaced by voluntary community self-defense. Thought Slime and Non-Compete both explain this in detail. We should focus not on punishment, but on restitution and rehabilitation. And that brings us... So, yes. This is written by Brad Bird. And let's see. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to quote a few fellow critics here. It goes into equal rights. Jack Jack has special needs. It's about perspective, how we think and believe things based on perspective. And... Some do say that the key concept is too close to that of the first one. Others say that they don't dislike the themes, but there are too many for one movie. I would definitely argue that some of the themes are really only brought up and not really, they, they don't get a lot of time and exploration. And at that point, you probably do want to just, yeah, uh, kill your darlings, you know. Now, let's see. And, yeah, the character arcs and subplots are repeated, unresolved, or just non-existent in the first place. And, yeah, and the direction was also handled by Brad Bird. And, yeah, again, quoting fellow critics, Brad Bird is a talented visual director and a great storyteller. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Winston Dever doesn't want to change what the super, supers do, just how they are perceived. A lot of aspects are the same as the first movie, even though the context is completely different. And let's see. Both of these movies are about superheroes being illegal, but in this one they fight it back against that status. Civil disobedience like MLK and Gandhi. And some say that the villain is the problem with the movie. And yeah, some say they don't think both of these movies should have been about the supers being illegal. The first movie was a satire on superhero movies. This one is just another superhero movie. And... Yeah, some say that the jokes with Jack-Jack the Baby are in place of good writing and point out that it's easy to make baby jokes. And yes, they're funny, but there were some in the first. They were removed from the first, and that's because they have nothing to do with the plot. Definitely, like, a strong argument could be made that they should be removed as funny as they are. And they are very, very funny. They definitely have nothing to do with, with the plot. And... I, I don't think that they're in exchange of, of good writing. I would say the writing is largely good, but for sure it is... Like, the movie feels like they're, they're worried that because it's been 14 years, people will be disappointed. So they try to fit in everything they think the audience want, including a couple of times where it doesn't completely make sense. And, yeah, uh, quoting another fellow credit here, some things that were popular in the first, right down to just the way they do the opening credits, is recreated here, but divorced from the original context. It feels like they're desperate to please fans and afraid to tread new ground. Now, I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I think the ending is pretty good. I... It... 
I didn't find it as satisfying as the ending of the first one. It does not rely on Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And the ending titles are great as with the first one, you know, the they're visually entertaining, you know, it's not the movie is over. It's it's like stills and and you know, yeah, but yeah. There are no post credit scenes. And yeah, the I really love the the use of superpowers in both of these movies. The characters use the superpowers in smart ways. They're not just using them in ways that look kind of cool, but ultimately don't make a lot of sense. No, they are legitimately, you know, you can understand why why they're doing what they're doing. It won't always work, but you can at least understand there's a logic behind it, you know. It's, it, we're, we're not watching people just being, you know, ineffective because they can't seem to think of how to do it right, you know. It's just, yeah. And the characters on the same team do combo attacks and there are compelling interpersonal conflicts between them and the movie does explain why the military is and such is not enough it's vigilantes fighting that brings us to the characters and yeah the yeah Craig T. Nelson returns as Bob Parr slash Mr. Incredible and, you know, now that he has to be a stay-at-home parent, you know, he does legitimately, he wants to do a good job. And he doesn't complain when, when Helen, you know, basically Helen goes out on missions and she's at first very worried that things are going to go wrong because she's... She used to be the stay-at-home parent. He doesn't have the kind of... He doesn't have as much practice as she does. Let's go with that. And this is kind of, you know... Yeah. It, it, they do really swap roles. In the first one, it was him going back out into the field. The, the biggest difference being that, you know, other than swapping out who's doing what, both of them are aware that, you know, in the first one, he kept it from her that he was doing hero stuff. But yeah, you know, this is not one of those movies that agrees with this idea that men should be praised for doing the bare minimum to take care of the family. You know, he, we, we see him struggle to, to try to live up to it. But, you know, and, and ultimately, like, I'm not going to give away exactly what, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say he, he has trouble with it at first. But the movie isn't saying that men shouldn't try or that the, you know, I, I don't really get the sense that they're saying that women should take care of the family, that men can't, and that women can't have a life outside of the family more that just she's the one who has practice with it you know they've been doing this for like 10 years uh, you know so so it's not yeah of course she has more practice with it he he went to work every single day she stayed at home and took care of the family every single day and yeah holly hunter plays helen parr the last girl once again and you know, she, yeah, she has the ability to stretch her body like rubber. At one point, she's in, you know, you know how there's, there's this encouraging saying, break a leg. At one point in this, she's told to stretch a leg. And she has this motorcycle that splits in half, allowing her to use her stretchy powers on it, which is great because a lot of their, a lot of superhero vehicles, it's kind of, Either they use the vehicle or they use their power. Like, it's, yeah, the the fact that, like, what was it that they gave Spider-Man? Was it, like, a car? Was it a helicopter? I, f I forget who had. I think they gave him a car at one point, at least. And it's like, 
why would he use a car? Like, okay, I guess if he's, like, driving through an area that doesn't have tall buildings, maybe. But, like, yeah, it just, it seems, yeah. And here, like, the, basically the bike can split in half. So if she stretches her upper body and her lower body apart, the, you know, she can still use the motorcycle. Which, you know, obviously, if you have very much familiarity with motorcycles, most of them can't do that. Trust me, I've tried. And let's see. Yeah. Quoting some fellow critics here, the movie explores what it's like for a woman to get back into the workforce after devoting a lot of her life to raising a family. And, you know, some people ask, why is Elastigirl on missions, not Bob? But, I mean, the movie explicitly says, you know, he breaks stuff and she's, like, she's good at protecting. And, it's, you know, he, in the movie, he says, oh, of course I break stuff. It's, you know, that's the, that's kind of what his... Like, yeah, you know, he's he's strong, so of course he's going to punch and throw stuff. But, yeah, she's she's really good at protecting. So, you know, in, in the movie, they explicitly, like, they say, we're going to start with the last girl. And in the long term, it's going to be the entire trio, you know, the, the couple and then Frozone going on missions. But they're going to start by using Elastigirl because she really makes them look good because she tends to not break stuff. And Sarah Vowell returns as Violet Parr. And, you know, she's she, she gives a great performance. She's very funny in both of these. But in this one, she really they really do a disservice to her character. I'm going to get into it in the... In the final section of this video. And Huckleberry Milner plays Dashiell Dash Parr, the family's troublemaker for son who has superhuman speed. He was originally voiced by Spencer Fox in the first film. And they simply, like, his, like, I want to say what happened was, like, his voice changed. You know, he no longer sounds like a, a young child, which is actually fairly understandable because he was no longer a 10-year-old child. The new one sounds a lot like him and gives a really good performance. Like, if you didn't know going into it that it's two different kids, I mean, yeah, you'd almost think that, uh, I don't know, I guess they pitched, switched, pi pi pitched up, I want to say, is the, it's been a while since I worked with pitch, but I've, seem to recall that pitching up makes the voice go higher. Me, uh, I may not have had enough sleep last night. There's some chance, because I realize what I just said <laughs> sounded very, yeah, very obvious. So, yeah, Eli Fuchile plays Jack-Jack Parr, the infant son of Bob and Helen, who has various powers, as we saw at the end of the first one. I just realized I did not yet say, but I am spoiling the first movie, but not the second movie, before I get into the thought sections. Now, the baby tends to be, either be funny or cute to the audience, but I appreciate that it is not one of those perfect Hollywood babies that never does anything gross. The amount of that is nowhere near, say, an Adam Sandler movie, though I definitely understand people who could say that it relies too much on the baby doing gross stuff, or obnoxious. Certainly, the characters find it very frustrating and exhausting to deal with. We find it funny and cute because we're not the ones having to deal with Jack-Jack. And... Yeah, the... Cinema Wins does a great job giving examples of how a lot of Jack-Jack's powers work well as metaphors for difficulty taking care of a toddler. And... Yeah, the some there's at least one critic who said, why is it such a big deal in this movie when the family realized that Jack-Jack has powers? Didn't they see that he had powers at the very end of the first movie. Now, me personally, I don't think it's difficult to believe that the 
family didn't see Jack Jack use powers at the end. They were very far away. And when you watch the first movie, you know, I, I watched the, I guess it's been a month by now, month and a couple of weeks maybe. At the end of the first movie, no, no member of the family react as if they did see the family have powers. And I, I think I saw someone say, well, if Jack Jack didn't have powers, why did he put on a mask at the end of the first one? That is, I, I can't really argue with that. I That is a, a case of they didn't really think they were going to be making a follow-up where it would be a big discovery that Jack-Jack has powers. But I don't think it's hard to believe that they didn't see it at the very end. They, like, again, watch the watch that part again. They were very far away. And let's see... Now and and you know the the let's see right the the yeah one thing according to the short Jack Jack Attack and a deleted scene of this you know Rick Dicker erased the the memory of the the babysitter Kari and you have to wonder why he bothered doing that if like if the family didn't know she saw the baby have like if if all it was was that she she babysat for a really long time then why why bother erasing her memory that's not gonna mean anything anyway Based on Jack Jack Attack and the deleted scene, there's no doubt that Rick Dicker knows that Kari saw his superpowers. I don't know. I guess it's possible that Rick Dicker didn't tell him. Honestly, I don't think they really thought about that aspect when writing this. But I don't think it's a problem for this movie that at the start of the movie, Jack Jack is the only one who knows that he has powers. And... Let's see. Yeah, Samuel Jackson is great as usual. Bob Odenkirk plays Winston Dever. I gotta say, I don't think I've seen him in anything since, like, the Ben Stiller show. He's still really great. But yeah, he plays Winston Dever, a superhero fan who leads a giant telecommunications company called DevTech with his sister Evelyn and wants to bring back superheroes by revamping the public's perception of them. And Catherine Keener plays his sister, Evelyn. And, yeah, she's a, she's a technological genius. And, yeah, I mean, I, you don't need me to tell you that Catherine Keener is an incredible actress. And she can do drama and comedy really well. You already know this. So, I'm just... You know, I'm just stating the obvious here. I realize that. And Brad Bird yet again plays Edna E. Mode, fashion designer for superheroes, a close friend of the Pars. And yeah, you know, ex excellent yet again. And let's see. And Jonathan Banks plays Rick Dicker government agent responsible for helping the par state undercover unremarkable banks replaces bud lucky who died in 2018 the film is dedicated to his memory and sophia bush plays karen slash void an aspiring superhero with the powers with the power to create portals and yeah I had seen Sophia Bush in other stuff. She gives a really great performance. You know, she has a distinct voice, so I I would have been able to tell that it was her, even if I didn't already know going in. But yeah, she gives a really great performance, and she plays a character that's very different from what I'm used to seeing. The characters I've seen her play are much more confident and kind of yeah, just you know she. And 
IMDb trivia says that her appearance and mannerisms s so resemble those of Kristen Stewart, it is rumored that the character is based on her. I mean, by 2018, was that really still how people thought of Kristen Stewart? I don't know, is she still awkward in interviews? She's not awkward in... I, I, I've seen her give performances where she's not awkward or kind of nervous and, and stammering and, and blinking all over. Like, I don't know, I, I kind of, like, we, we all know by now, you know, her performance in the Twilight films, which I haven't seen, I've only seen clips, that was down to the direction, you know, and, and I think back then she was awkward in real life. I've, I've seen, like, stuff from, like, interviews and was there maybe, like, did she do, did she host SNL once and, and we saw that she, and, and she said she's just as, you know, awkward in real life as she was on camera. As far as, I, f I feel like I've seen interview or something where she was much more confident since, anyway. But yeah, you know, maybe based on the way she used to. And let's see. Oh, that's right. And and Phil Lamar plays a couple of different superheroes. And Isabella Rossellini plays Ambassador Selick, a foreign official. And yeah, she she reprised her role in the Italian dubbing of the movie since she is fluent in both languages. And John Ratzenberger returns as the Underminer. He doesn't have as much screen time as I would like for him to, but it you're never gonna hear me complain about seeing John Ratzenberger and something. And Jeer Burns again should have been in way more of of the movie than he is but again never gonna yeah that was usher i thought his voice sounded familiar anyway but yeah the they do a pretty decent job of like the movie the characters are not there's, there's some, like, character growth and character kind of... They're in, they're in different places, some of them. Now, something that is worth noting about the people who dislike the directions that this movie took, say it's too feminist, too woke, is that a number of them do appreciate that the first movie wasn't just about Bob, it was about the family, and several of them clearly understand what was going on with Helen and Violet and are not dismissive of that. I've seen some people, though, say that the movie's called, you know, the movie's called The Incredibles. Technically, it's called The Incredibles 2. They dropped the the, since there's more than one now. If it was supposed to be about Elastigirl, it should be called Elastigirl. The first movie was called The Incredibles, and it was primarily about Mr. Incredible. And by that logic, that one should have been called Mr. Incredible. This one actually is about the entire Incredibles family, so the title makes much more sense this time around. Now, let's see, that, and, some people do say that the characters are too different, since there's supposed to have been no time, like, literally, the, you know, did I... I think there was someone who said, you know, it's made 14 years later, and it's set 14 seconds later. Like, literally, the very start of this, we hear some of the things, like, the first one ends with the Underminer's speech. This one opens with some of that same speech, and we see it from a different perspective. So, literally, it is, yeah. And, yeah, the movie humanized some of the characters. We actually get to see Bob spend time with his kids in this one. He barely did in the first one, to the point where some people online theorize they're not his kids, or at least Violent isn't, and part of that is because of the hair. I mean, it does, it does happen, you know. Anyway, 
so the yeah the dialogue there are 69 entries in the IMDb quote section and they are all good and Yeah, it, it really, you get a good sense of who the different people are based on what they're saying. You know, so, some of the characters in this don't get to say very much at all, but what they say speaks volumes. Now, the cinematography is really great. Like, it's very easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes, and the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm like dialogue scenes now the editing is also also helps keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes like when 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 there are things that move really fast it won't suddenly cut to an angle that is difficult for the for the eye and the brain to parse or like cut at an odd time like this you know if you want to know how to do comic book action right like visually this is the kind of movie you want to study this and the first one it really is incredible how like some of these scenes it's incredible how much happens and how fast it's moving but you're never confused because they they have a very they're they're really really good at keeping the focus where it needs to be and yeah so the animation is really you know it's a lot of things happened in those 14 years and let's see yeah I've, I've seen critics say there's too little color in the first one, but this one has a lot of it, and it's great. I would have to agree, yeah, for, for sure. Like, the first, I mean, part of it is also the first has the aesthetic of the the kind of spy, you know, 60s spy movie, and there wasn't as much color in those. The, this one is, like, a superhero movie, so you have colorful costumes and superpowers and such. And yeah, this was this was made on a two hundred million dollar budget, and yeah, it it looks it it looks expensive, and the box office is one point two hundred and forty five billion. So yeah, it was it was pretty successful. And. Yeah, the some of the best action sequences, according to some critics. Oh, I would agree. Now, I guess technically, okay. So this is kind of this is um this is a spoiler. So if you don't want the spoiler, mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. The action scene, according to one critic. The action scenes are too similar. Good guys have to stop a large vehicle from crashing into people and buildings. No more spoilers. And that brings us to the music. was handled by Michael Giacchino, who also did the score for No Way Home. And Alias Lost. And yeah, he, he gives a really, he, he, he crafted a really great score for them. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and quote a fellow critic here. Composer G Giacchino's music is the most successful element, running nimble, beautifully orchestrated variations on themes that feel familiar in the best ways while retaining their spark. 
And yeah, you can actually listen to a lot of the soundtrack here on YouTube, and I recommend you do so. Also watch the movie, though. Don't, you know... I feel like that's the kind of thing, you know, if you're not also going to watch the movie, then it feels like... It, even though you're, you know, it's on Disney+, Plus. that's how I watched it, so you're paying the same thing whether you're watching it or not. And... Yeah, some, some people found that some of the jokes are just too childish. I, I certainly don't think there were very many of them. Maybe some of them were pretty childish, yeah. But yeah, the, there's puns, slapstick, verbal comedy. And yeah, so the pacing. If you don't watch a lot of animated movies, keep in mind that a lot of them move much faster than live-action movies, and this is one of those cases. Now, the first film you know, had some build-up before we saw the main attraction of the family using powers, especially together, which worked really well. This one does have some of that from right away, but then, you know, considering that it picks up right after the ending of the first one, that's really not a surprise. That is very much what the first one hinted at. And... Yeah, so the movie is an hour and 47 and a half minutes long without end credits and an hour and 59 minutes long with them. And I would say it's worth that investment of time. Some people feel that the last third is over long and I can understand what they mean. And definitely it feels like they're worried that people are going to leave the movie feeling like there wasn't enough action in the climax. And comparatively, like, the, the first movie doesn't have as much action, and that, you know, obviously, the 14 years, a lot happened with animation software. The first one, they could not have put as much action in as they did with this one. And with this one, you could argue it's kind of, it feels like a matter of course, like, they can, so they do. The first one... Overall, I would say is more emotionally resonant because the you know the, there can't be as much action. So what they do is make sure that it means something, and I would say largely the action means something in this one too. But there are a couple of times where it felt like okay, they just wanted to do action. They thought that was a cool action scene. I wouldn't. I'm, I'm glad I watched the whole thing, you know, but I could understand if some people might want to fast forward through some of the third act. Like, if you're watching it with someone who's watched it before, and you both agree that, okay, the third act, you know, let's let's move on, you know, you can have the other person fast forward. If you try it yourself, you'll probably miss something, but if as long as they know. That brings us... Yeah, so, let's see, I I try to, to go into the worst aspect. I think, overall, it would probably have to be that the first one basically felt like everything is exactly the way it needs to be. Everything makes perfect sense because of the circumstances that we're looking at and then with this a lot of it is the same even though the circumstances have changed or should have changed and that is yeah it i don't think it's a big deal but like i get if if you love the first one and it was a huge deal to you this one might feel like a letdown, and that is what I've seen. A lot of people have said it was a letdown. A lot of people also said that they loved it as much or even more, but a lot of people did say it was a letdown. And... Let's see... Yeah, I was kind of worried that it would regress some characters and such, like some sequels do, and sadly, some of them, yeah. I was most looking forward to getting more of the family and their powers, and the movie lives up to my ex lived up to my expectations on that. Now the trailers do give away a little bit too much, 
I think they could have gotten audience interest without spoiling, but at the same time, if you you know if you like the trailers, you're very likely to like the movie as well. The cover I don't think gives away too much and gives you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. Now the yeah, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 93% on the tomato meter and an 84% audience score based on over 10,000 ratings. And the consensus is Incredibles 2 reunites Pixar's family crime-fighting team for a long-awaited follow-up that may not quite live up to the original, but comes close enough to earn its name. The average critic rating is 7.90 out of 10. 362 fresh ratings versus 26 rotten ones. And the average user rating was 4.1 out of 5, which makes it certified fresh. Now, the Metacritic rating is 80 out of 100, with the user rating being 7.8. And when I checked, the last user review was from February 15th, 25th, 25th of this year. On IMDb, it has the top rating. Uh, right. I need to read my notes more quick. Right. The the I read the the user reviews on IMDb voted to be the top 100 out of the 1,127 total, and 25 people did give it. A 1 out of 10. 15 gave it 2 out of 10. 17, 3 out of 10. 10 gave it 4 out of 10. 1 gave it 5 out of 10. 6, or 4 gave it 6 out of 10. 10 gave it 7. 11 gave it 8. 4 gave it 9. 5 gave it 10. So, yeah, there's... It... On there, more people really... The, the most useful... The IMDb user reviews voted most useful are more negative than positive. And uh, just to see, I did a word search result. I, I tried writing feminists. So anything that says feminism, feminist, that kind of thing. 26 in the top 100 reviews. Th three results for woke. Six for drink. Three for swear. 17 for politic, 9 for agenda. So that gives you a bit of an idea of what people took issue with. And yeah, I guess I'll just briefly say I am woke, so I, I am progressive, so I don't think that it's a... I think it's a good thing, not a bad thing, but I don't think that this movie does a bad job like you know one thing people point to is well you know the first one it was the man who got to do heroes of now it's the woman and it's like it's not like the movie doesn't like the, it explores issues there it's not just like a wish fulfillment and nothing else you know and and the first one did as well but the yeah, I, I don't think that the movie, like, you know, breaks itself trying to s satisfy a woke agenda. I do agree that there are a couple of people who pointed to things where it wasn't as woke as, you know, it could be. I do think a couple of those are issues. I'll get into them in the, in the thoughts sections, especially in the last thought section. Now, on IMDb, it has a user rating of 7.6 based on 280,049 users voting. And yeah, 31.7 gave it an 8. 26.9 gave it a 7. 14.5 gave it a 9. 10.9 gave it a 10. 10.1 gave it a 6. So of, of overall votes, not very many gave it a, a negative rating. And... That brings us... Right, so on... Let's 
see. Yeah, if you don't already have Disney Plus, but you are a fan of Pixar, as far as I can tell, every single Pixar feature is on there. And many of the shorts, I did not look for all of them. And yeah, for this specifically, has, you know, on Disney Plus, it has 42 minutes of deleted scenes. And they're excellent. They, you know, they have basically all the same qualities as the film itself. Funny, dramatic, well-acted, impressive visuals. Although the animation is a very early stage. You know, they're basically, they're cut for timing. That kind of, uh, pacing, that kind of thing. And, yeah, one minute of Evelyn animation outtakes, which is fun. I wouldn't recommend watching it before watching the movie, though. If, if I recall, it has, like, a spoiler in it. And two minutes of fake toy ads, which really nailed the parody. 14 minutes of interesting behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah, definitely well worth, you know, yeah. So, overall, I rate this eight great, but not amazing, long-awaited sequels out of ten. And honestly... I just got done watching it. I could sit down and watch it again or immediately. Like, it's... Yeah. That brings us to the thoughts section. So, I'm going to put the spoiler sign up. And, yeah. Starting with notes taken while watching. Now, I decided to add in the notes taken while watching the two shorts, Jack-Jack Attack and Auntie Edna. So, yeah, gonna start with those. Jack-Jack Attack. I love the music going from soft to operatic. Kari getting into ridiculous details, spelling her name is funny. And I love that, you know, she she turns her back for one second and Jack-Jack is gone. And then she plays hide-and-seek and the baby actually disappears. You know, that's, that's such a great, like, because, yeah... And starts floating. And like I said in my video for the first movie, I really appreciate that she keeps trying to keep up. You know, she sees that the baby can float, so she puts him in an upside down playpen to keep him from floating. When he burns through that, the next time she tries to prevent him from floating, she's got him tied with a belt to like massive weights for weightlifting. I'm guessing Mr. Incredible used to use. And finally, clearly some time has passed when the camera pans down to the house, and we see that she's experienced his powers many times. There are scorch marks and knocked over things and such, and she's just completely ready for them. She's blasé about the fire, fire extinguisher, eye lasers, mirror to deflect, and we see that she's done this several times because there's like other marks in the ceiling. I love how Jack-Jack is never actually scared by his abilities. Like when he's floating through the air, phasing through walls, he's laughing. He's having a great time. And clearly, clearly Jack-Jack does understand the flashcards. He imitates the triangle. He seems to understand house. So when she holds up the campfire, he thinks, Oh, fire! Yeah, I can make fire! And the music gets operatic, like, in the opening. I don't know what it's called, but it's definitely supposed to imply, like, hack demons or something. H-E double hockey sticks. And when Jack-Jack's on fire, you know, she... Now she has to put... The, the first time, she has to put him out, so she grabs him with the the thing from the fire poker set and she almost puts him in the toilet but then realizes I can't do that and you believed him the baby was exploding fair counterpoint and that brings us to Auntie Edna I like that in contrast to Carrie uh, it's ah uh, what is this yeah you know Edna loves seeing all the superpowers although she does get overwhelmed with the clones and such and yeah, technology improving in the last 14 years means that this one can go a lot wilder with powers, move a lot faster. And I think basically every power we see in the movie itself shows up in this short, and maybe some that don't show up in the movie. And... See. Yeah, and, and then just waits for beast mode Jack-Jack to eventually tire himself out. Which, I've never taken care of a toddler, and... Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have, even if the court didn't demand that, but I hear that sometimes you kind of just have to wait for them to tie themselves out.
And it's really, it's such a cool idea that Edna makes this suit that can handle all of Jack Jack's powers. The room is yours. They are lucky to be in your presence. You are a tiny god, but is he a golden god? And that brings us to Incredibles 2. I love that it opens very similar to the opening of Jack Jack Attack, and the movie wastes no time getting to the fight with the Underminer, which is what a significant chunk of the audience has been waiting 14 years for. I appreciate that Tony is legitimately likable. You can really tell that this is a 2018 superhero movie. It's, you know, it's much bigger and right from the start. I mean, the the, the first one is also really big, but just, yeah, com compare the... the, the uh, how fast it moves, how much there is. You know, in the first one, you have the, the Omnidroid going through the city. Then in this one, you have him going under the city, and, and like, he gets the bank to fall down, and then you have the, the what's it called, the, the train car thing, and, and all this, you know, yeah, just... And and the, yeah, and they have to stop the the giant drill itself, and just huge amount of stuff. And Underminer has jackhammer gloves, clearly prepared to fight Mister Incredible. And the kids argue over who babysits Jack. Jack Dash saves an old lady, even bothers to adjust her glasses, takes after his father. It's really cool seeing the kids using their power so comfortably right from the start. They didn't undo at least that part of the ending. I appreciate that the characters try multiple different ways of stopping the, the drill. It's just that most of them fail, even though they were good ideas. Also really love seeing all the teamwork on display from right away. Huge amount of cops pointing guns at the Incredible Family. I don't know, I guess they thought they were apprehending the Blues Brothers. I like that Helen and Bob try to talk things out. Winston makes a really great first impression. And the house is really, really cool. And the, I, I like that, like, at first, you know, Dash has the, the remote and he's like, wow, this is so cool. And the others are like, wow, this is a fancy house. And then he starts pressing stuff that makes things, like, you know, at first this just opens and there's like pools under the, you know, oh, that's that's kind of cool. But then he opens and there's like pools under where the furniture is standing and that just seems like bad planning, but I don't know, whatever, you know, and yeah, things go really wrong and yeah. I, I forget who would, I, th I think it was a pitch meeting where he points out, I have, you know, now he loves pushing buttons. And Bob thought that he got the baby to sleep, but then it wakes up, turns on the TV, then he falls asleep while trying to get it to sleep. Very exciting when Last Girl deals with the hover train. A lot of the things that Helen tries to stop the hover train don't work out, but luckily, she has a few more bright ideas. And since Jack-Jack got out of the crib last time, now Bob blocks it with like a table and some books. Jack-Jack still gets out, so he just ends up watching television with him. Excellent fight between Jack-Jack and the raccoon. Love the rescue of the ambassador with the helicopters and all. Yeah. And Elastigirl figures out how to find the screen slaver. Very cool. I mean, it is easy to understand why people would have a more positive ideas of superhero... The positive, yeah, view on superheroes from watching the dash cam footage, as it were, instead of only realizing, you know, oh, something ended up breaking, and then seeing the heroes there. And I love the atmosphere and tension as Helen gets closer and closer to what appears to be the screensaver, later revealed to be a pizza guy. What was it? He was surly, the pizza was cold, and he was late, Some, something like that. Great level of detail in the lair, love the fight itself, too. And Elastigirl figures out that sometimes a pizza delivery guy is just a pizza delivery guy. He gave you a pretty good fight. Or, should I say, I did. His eyes and his ears. I love the family playing with the baby and his powers in the house. 
very cool when the kids in Frozone have to get away from the mind-controlled heroes. And the Incredible shows up. And I like, you know, Frozone is like, it's a, you know what, managerial oversight they sent you, they also sent me. You guys can go home, I got this. And then they're like, we were also sent to get you. So, whoops. Good try, though. Worth a shot. And the fight between Helen and Bob was really cool. And really, really just so... That when, when she, like... Let's see, I think it's that, like, they... Yeah, she goes in for a kiss. And then it's just a way to get the glasses on him. Yeah, that that hurt. And the kids realize using Jack Jack they can save the day. I thought it was pretty funny how like for a while it seems to be going okay with the you know using Jack Jack like that, but then the the little thing breaks, so they have no control over his powers anymore. And and the you know using his eye zapping lasers you know, like, grabbing him and holding him. Zap, 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 zap. It's, uh, it was pretty funny. Very cool. I like Void, you know, struggling to help Elastigirl get onto the, the jet there at the end. You know, it, it took a couple tries, but she got there. I, I, yeah, I think eventually she just started teleporting. The, the final teleport goes inside of the ship, you know, and it, or, or the plane. You know, all the other times Elastigirl would land on and try to hold on. Like, land on or land under and try to hold on. And, you know, be... Yeah, like, because it's insane, the, the pressure up there, you know, and that speed. But, yeah, eventually Void was like, oh, inside, I guess. Really like the fight between Void and Violet. You know, at first, like... I, I like how Void tries to deal with the uh, invisibility, for example. At one point, she uses, like, a, a fire extinguisher, which is just a family thing by now. You know, if, if someone is struggling with one of these kids, they're going to use a fire extinguisher on them. And the... It, yeah, at one point, like, you know, Violet makes a, a force field around her, and then Void makes a, a portal under... Uh, you know, because because the force field doesn't cover under, so yeah, that whole thing. And and there's a part where I want to say his name is Crusher. He's like crushing. You know, yeah, they they have the the, you know, Violet has the has the force field up, but he's you know making the the force field smaller. Yeah, they they did a really great job on that. I love the fighting on the ship. I really love that everyone uses their superpowers and abilities in smart ways. I thought the choreography was great throughout. And ends with the entire family going... Uh, yeah. Leaving for the... You know, to stop all the, the robbers. And Violet makes sure to get Tony out of the way so that he doesn't see something again and they have to start all over again. And over some of the end credits, we get to hear the theme songs, and this time with musical backing. So I quite appreciate that. That brings us to the final section, which is called Notes. There we go. Notes taken before watching. Now, let's see. Okay, so let's see the right. So yeah, quoting some fellow critics here: the villain wants to make superheroes legal so she can make them illegal again. I knew who the villain was from very early in the movie, even the trailer. The villain is revealed too late. It's a boring character with an overcomplicated backstory. I love the scenes where the heroes are mind controlled. The villain's plan doesn't make any sense. People with green eyes. Let's see. We're seeing now acting completely out of character. 
because of the giant hypnotic glasses they're wearing. Nobody has seen them wear back when they were behaved in character. Now, I can't really comment on if it's easy to figure out that Evelyn is the villain. I saw spoilers for this back when I didn't think I was going to eventually watch it. So, yeah, I, I never didn't know. I, I've never watched the movie not knowing that she's going to turn out to be the villain. The movie raises the issue of if superhero movies make people less likely to act, but it does leave us on the note of believing superheroes in the movies can empower us to be better. better. That's what we see in the new superheroes that are inspired by Helen. You know, so, some people felt that the movie didn't, you know, yeah, thought that superhero movies were bad and we're bad for liking them. And I, I completely disagree with that reading of it. These movies don't make the case for supers being a good thing. Both of the villains exist because of the supers. If Evelyn wants supers to be illegal, why does she make Helen look good only to then undo that? They were already illegal. Her plan is convoluted. I mean, the basic, basically the idea is to make it so that they will never be legal. That's, you know, I believe a direct quote. I think, let's see, if you, I'm trying to think if I can compare it to a real life social movement. I, I mean, the basic idea is someone like, you know, if, if Evelyn doesn't go along with what Winston is doing, and she also, I mean, there's only so much she can do to change his mind, you know, the, the, if she doesn't go along with him, someone else will come along and do that same thing, and then she won't be able to, you know, work her yeah she won't be able to work her angle on it basically by making it temporarily appear that it's a really good thing and then making it look especially bad you know it hits harder than if you know, if people already didn't have a high opinion of them and then something bad happens, that's Tuesday. But if people don't have a high opinion of them and then they do have a really high opinion of them, but then things go really wrong, you know, that takes a lot more to, to recover from. But I, you know, her plan is convoluted. And a number of people pointed out, why wasn't the telephone inside this, the panic room anyway? And it does legitimately seem like the, the yeah, uh, it, it really is just, why is the, ah, uh, what's the word? Anyway, um, I mean, I, I guess maybe you can't get a telephone to work in there, but no, but because it, it's a, it's a hard line. That just means that there has to be a wire. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and let's see. Yeah. One person said instead of the Denver dad, yeah. Instead of trying to call supers, you're trying to stop the burglary himself. So being inspired to do good is what Evelyn hates. And yeah, someone said too much of the film is a retread of the first, only sloppier. In the first movie, Helen is devoted to the family, but then in the second, she's a nostalgic adrenaline junkie like Bob was in the first, which she criticized him for, rightly. Let's see. And the movie agreed with her, but here the movie does think that it's great for Helen to go out like this. She doesn't even go home to visit. She lives in a hotel, doesn't call the kids. She calls to tell Bob how much fun she's having. I agree with a lot of that. I mean, 
the adrenaline junkie thing though let's see in the uh let me think yeah cuz in the first one they also said that they were trying to improve the 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 opinion of this if, I'm pretty sure at least he wasn't just like smashing big robots for no good reason ah uh, but the the um, yeah I, I I guess I don't really have I hate to say it but that is it seems right let's see yeah, and the twist is that the private company that hired a super is actually evil, is the exact same as in the first. And again, you know, like, for the main characters, they literally just experienced this. In the first, Violet realized that her self-value comes from herself, not whether a kid in high school likes her. But, every, but in this movie, everything she says and does revolves around that kid. Yeah. I, I really wish they hadn't done that. Because this movie starts with such a big action scene, later in the movie we no longer care about the action. In the first movie there's escalation, the stakes rise over the course of the movie. I wouldn't say that I don't care, but I will... I do think that it would have been more impactful if the action hadn't been that big right from the start. But again, like, if you think at other superhero movies coming out, around the same you know 2018 I'm pretty sure Infinity War came out in 2018 so yeah you know that is something to have you know if they, if they wanted to still seem relevant because in 2004 the first movie really worked for 2004 if the first movie had come out in 2018 people would be calling it dated and I think they were worried that that would happen with this one Now, let's see. It takes the heroes way too long to realize that the way to win in the end is to take the hypno goggles off the heroes. Way too many screens for, the, for a story taking place in the 1960s. It fits with today, but not then. Let's see. If Screen Slaver wants to prove that people shouldn't depend on superheroes, why does she keep creating scenarios that only superheroes could stop? The cops can't stop a runaway train. What did e Evelyn Deva's father think that the supers could do? He was about to call ones that can't teleport and the burglars are already inside the house. They can't stop the burglars even if he was able to call them. I, f I forget exactly what powers they have, but yeah, the, the powers that they had were not... Yeah, if they tried to call Void, that would make sense, but although, you know, she wouldn't have been born or not very old back then and let's see. yeah so some issues with the feminism of the movie is the violet obsesses over Tony first movie her arc was specifically about her learning to be more confident here her self-worth is at least partially based on this one boy liking her and for all the heroic things she does Elastigirl does end up needing saving in the first movie Elastigirl saves herself and two kids and is well on her way to saving Bob Though Mirage is the one who frees him, and then Violet saves the rest of the family after they get caught. In the first movie, no man saves a superpowered woman. The women save themselves, each other, and the men. Feels like there are two different movies here. There's Elastigirl and her adventures, and then there is Bob as a stay-at-home father. One causes the other, but they don't affect each other otherwise. The first movie is about the family working as a unit. The start of the film feels completely separate from the rest of the film. I think there were huge rewrites that didn't take into account what there was at the start of the film. If you're a good person, you can only change the perception of others. If you're also rich, if you're not rich, it doesn't matter how good you are, you can't. If you are rich and you're evil, you can ruin the reputation of people who do good and you decide what is good or evil for other people since one's perception is one's reality. That is a very... Yeah, sadly, you know, that does appear to be the, the takeaway. Ah, uh, let's see. I guess, no, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and read aloud the entire thing, but 
if you like it can be a little difficult to pick up every single thing the screen the entire screen flavor monologue because it's not just we're not just hearing that we're also seeing Elastigirl trying to get to her but someone wrote the entire thing in IMDb quotes you know you can yeah if you do a word search for the screen slaver interrupts this program for an important announcement it you should yeah you know find it real quick and yeah you know the the one of the let's see yeah one, one of the major themes of the of the monologue is this idea that today people aren't active enough and there are a lot of problems today with getting people more involved too many do just figure up oh, thing you know the important things are being dealt with we need more activism voting alone isn't enough to change things you know i i really don't get um an anti-superhero movie or superhero story vibe from this movie i do get a vibe of we really got it get it together if we want to change things because and and that is true like a lot of things have gotten a lot worse since 2004 and and 2004 was actually a time when a lot of people thought okay now things can't get any worse you know with with patriot act and and all this you know and yeah a lot of things have gotten a lot worse even though a lot of people care about these things you know not not enough is being done now let's see so yeah the IMDb parents guide uh, you know under threatening and intense scenes says Violet's tantrum can be very upsetting somehow play for laughs sadly a lot of men don't take women's anger seriously I think that's why but yeah I agree it shouldn't be now the movie the first movie says that while what Bob's doing is heroic it is in part about him being nostalgic thrill-seeking wanting his life to be the way it was before he settled down and had a family and basically he needs to include his family the you know into the super stuff he needs to spend more time with his family also it is isolating him from his family this movie says the same about helen only now it is painted as good or at the very least not bad even the isolation i think they were afraid that would be read as that it's saying and just to be clear i definitely disagree with the following and don't think that is any more wrong if it's done by a woman than if done by a man although you know women are seen as more important for the family to do well that if a mother and or wife does something positive that is separate from her family then that means they shouldn't do that positive thing she should only exist for her family which is obviously a problematic message and ultimately I'm not entirely certain that they could avoid seeming like that's what they were saying and since the first one has been read as objectivist. I could understand why they were afraid of being misunderstood since there's just a soul trying to do good. But if that was how they felt, and it appears that was how they felt about it, not. Is that how they felt about it? Anyway, you know, the logical conclusion would be to have the story and themes be something else as it is the movie has its cake and eats it too and yeah it, it it would be a better movie if it completely accepted that now let's see yeah elastigirl doesn't really have a character arc it's legitimately a disappointment that the only growth she goes through is the very literal growth and shrinkage because she's elastic and does that we feel weird to say now yeah, so in, in both of these, when it is only Bob the Patriarch or Helen the Matriarch of the family fighting by himself or herself, they are not able to take out the villain, but when the rest of the family join them in the superheroics, they are able to take out the villain. Now, ultimately, the first movie could do more to resolve the suspicion of Helen that Bob's cheating on her. I guess it's supposed to be that Mirage helps them with the rocket. Now, this movie does not bring it back up. But yeah, the the um, at least there isn't something quite like that. That really frustrated me, especially when I thought back on it. Now, strength of the first movie is that the internal struggle for the characters is that 
they aren't allowed to be themselves. Basically, the movie ultimately comes down on the side of if other people don't like it when you are yourself, that's their problem. As long as what you are doing isn't hurting anyone, especially if it's helping people, then be yourself. Just don't exclude your loved ones from your life to be yourself. To be yourself. And yeah, that is something that this says as well. And I do really appreciate that it brings up this idea of, I hate the term illegal, because the, the idea that a person could be illegal is just so utterly morally re reprehensible. But yeah, let's go with immigration. It brings up immigration. It brings up the idea of, you know, some people being second class citizens even though they haven't actually done something wrong, but because of the way that they are perceived by a lot of people. And I wish that it did more with it because it's such an important issue today and was in 2018. But yeah, you know, that and the police brutality thing, you know, complete with dash cams and, and how the police are verbally abusive to the Incredibles, even though they, like, you know, the, the, yeah, the, let's see, the cop's argument is that things would have been fine if they didn't get involved, and, yeah, I mean, I guess that is, that is kind of the ultimate pro-status quo argument, that, so, yeah, you know, the movie brings up, if you try to change things, some people will be very frustrated with you, but does it really ultimately change? I guess the, yeah, it, yeah, I think an argument could be made that it says that if you are doing the right thing, but you don't have someone making sure that people realize that what you're doing is the right thing. But that is to be, that is actually, yeah, a big part of politics today is making sure you that people realize why certain things are the way they are and who is helping, who is hurting, and who's doing nothing. So, yeah. But, yeah, some of these themes definitely they could have gone more into. But overall, I do think it's... Yeah. I mean, again, I only watched the, the first one, you know, what, month and a half ago. I didn't watch it in 2004. I can't really completely imagine what it's like waiting for 14 years for this. I can understand being frustrated, even if you didn't necessarily think it was terrible. But yeah, so, the yeah, that is the end of the video. So... Please go to the comment section. Let me know. Did you think that, you know, yeah, what did you think should have been different about this? Who was your favorite of the new superheroes? Uh, let's see. Is there any other? I guess, do you hope for a third movie or like a video game or something to continue the story? And if so, do you think we should again just get something that picks up right after, or do they think do you think they should set it further down the line, or maybe do a prequel or something? And if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one two or more links to stuff like a relevant playlist, say suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoilers of thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Star Wars Disney Plus show, which these days is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.